Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the second part of cerebellum. This is a continuation of the first part. So I would suggest you to watch the first part and then come back to this video. Now coming to the lectures that we are discussing. We are discussing the CNS lecture wherein the motor system is being discussed. In that our last lecture is on the cerebellum. In our previous cerebellum lecture, we were discussing about the functional areas of cerebellum, neuronal circuit and functional units of cerebellar cortex. Now today we are going to discuss about the functions of cerebellum, then cerebellar function test and the cerebellar dysfunctions. So let's get into the topic. So coming to the functions of cerebellum, in a, its overall control is there in the motor control system. Basically whenever any motor activity is going on, it is going to enhance it or do some corrections in that motor activity. It does this function at three levels. That is the vestibulo cerebellum, then spino cerebellum and finally the cerebro cerebellum. We have already seen this diagram. Here V represents the vermis, then IZ is for the intermediate zone, then LZ is for the lateral zone. These are our functional divisions. And below this we have the floco nodular lobe. So these are the functional divisions in the cerebellum. So coming to the functions of each of them, let's start with the vestibulo cerebellum. As the term indicates, it includes the vestibular apparatus along with the cerebellum. That is the floco nodular lobe in the cerebellum and another region that is the vermis in the cerebellum. So what is this importance? What is the importance of vestibulo cerebellum connections? So it is important for very rapid movements, especially during a directional change because the directional change will be detected by our vestibular apparatus and it detects the directional change and it will instruct the cerebellum that the particular person is moving in this particular direction so that the actions can be taken by the cerebellum. Next thing is as the worm is indicated, worm is, is involved in controlling the central region. It controls the central portions of the muscles which include the spine, the hip region as well as the shoulder region because it has a homunculus representation, a similar homunculus representation like that of a cortex. It is not very detailed but the vermis portion is for the central portions of the body. So whenever there is a defect in it, what is going to happen? The person is going to suffer from equilibrium defect and the posture disturbances because it is maintaining the posture. The central group of muscles is for maintaining the posture whereas the peripheral, the distal parts is for the fine movements. Now coming to the second part which is a very very important part, it is called spino cerebellum. This spino cerebellum has various inputs also and various outputs also. So what are the most important components of a spino cerebellum? It includes two structures, one is the intermediate zone, another one is the interpost nuclei. Interpost nuclei is one of the deep nuclei of the cerebellum. So what it does is this intermediate zone of the cerebellum receives the impulses from or the inputs from various places. Let's see what all the different places. It receives from the red nucleus, the motor cortex and the peripheral muscles. This functions as a comparator. For example, it has two influences, one from the higher centers like the motor cortex and red nucleus. Both of them, what they do is they tell the intended action, like what action has to be needed. I already told in the previous class, it says the blueprint to the cerebellum also. Now what the cerebellum does? It has to compare this blueprint. It compares with the blueprint of the muscles and changes its action accordingly. For this two important tracks we saw it, what are they? One is the corticoponto cerebellar tract which comes from the highest center and which gives the efferent copy. Efferent copy is given by the ventral spino cerebellar tracts. So it will compare both of this and finally it will send the output required from the intermediate zone of the cerebellum. So coming to the outputs, there are several outputs. First, it has to send it to the motor cortex also. If it is a gross error, the motor cortex will receive the impulse and change the action itself. And next thing is it has to send impulses to the muscles. It does it via the thalamus. Through the thalamus, the impulses go to the motor cortex. One output is this and the second output is through the red nucleus, it goes to the muscles. So both these outputs finally will be going from the intermediate zone of the cerebellum. Already one of the output would have come from the motor cortex directly to the muscles. Now if any correction needs to be done, again this pathway can be activated and some corrections can be done like gross correction can be done. Minor corrections will be directly done by the cerebellum itself. So what does it do? It provides a smooth coordination of movements between the distal limb. 
Why we are saying distal limb? Because the intermediate zone is involved in the distal limb. It has a small homunculus which is controlling the distal limbs. And it prevents the tendency to overshoot. What is overshoot? Whenever a person is trying to do some work, if he goes above the reaction, then it is called as overshoot. For example, if he wants to touch the nose and it is shooting again or like over, that is this phenomenon is called as overshoot. This can be prevented with the help of the spinocerebellum. So now coming to the third zone, which is the cerebrocerebellum zone. As we can see here, this involves the lateral zone. This involves the lateral zone and the cerebellar cortex. In this diagram, this lateral zone does not have any kind of homunculus representation. What is its primary function? We saw that its primary function is to planning of movements. So basically, it plans the timing of movements, sequence of movements, as well as the overall plan of the movement. It is going to plan, sequence, time the movements. There is one interesting thing about the cerebellum. This fires the next sequence while an ongoing movement is going on. Whenever a person is doing a movement and whenever the cerebellar neurons were observed, they saw that in this zone, there is a uh, pattern which is generated for a next movement. It means that the cerebellum is ready for the next action also. That, that's how powerful the cerebellum is. And it also does the extra motor predictive functions. So if this part is getting defective, what will happen? What will happen is there will be obstruction in the smooth progression because it is predicting the next movement. This smooth progression of one movement to the next movement will not happen. Suppose a person is running and he had to, has to stop behind before a wall. What will happen? Now he cannot predict it. So this extra motor predictive also will be gone. And finally, this person might hit the wall. Like he will not start just before the wall because his cerebellum is not functional. So these are the issues whenever cerebrocerebellum is gone in a defect. Now coming to the cerebellar function test. What are the tests that we can do for a cerebellar function? Coming to the first test, which is the finger nose test. Here we will ask the subject to touch the examiner's finger and go back to his nose. So while doing this, what will happen? The extra motor predictive work is not done if the cerebellum is not there. So there can be a little overshoot. This we will discuss in the defects. Then what we will ask the subject to do is we will ask them to draw a circle. Next, there is one test which is called as repeated pronation and supination movement. That is called diadocokinesia. What is this? Here we will ask the subject to place his one palm and use, using his hand, we will ask him to do repeated pronation and supination movement. If he is not able to do, then also we will discuss them in the defect part. Now coming to the test that is done for the lower limbs, which is the heel knee test. And we will ask the subject to walk along a straight line also. Then finally, we will do the Rombach test. So these are the cerebellar function tests. We will try to put extensive video for all the tests also. Now coming to the dysfunction. What will happen whenever the person is having some cerebellar disorder? First thing is he will not be able to perform the coordinated movements. What then he will have something called as dysmetria. What is dysmetria? So whenever a person is performing an action, for example, he wants to touch his note, there will be an overshoot. Now the person will think to correct it. But what will happen again? Again, there will be an overshoot in the opposite direction. So the person will be moving in a pendular fashion like this. This kind of movement is called as dysmetria. And the uncoordinated behavior or the uncoordinated movements which happens because of this dysmetria is called as ataxia. Ataxia is a gross term where the uncoordinated movements happens because of dysmetria. And what is pause pointing? Pause pointing is the one the subject is not able to exactly stop at the point where he wants. There is always an overshoot. So pause pointing is that. And suppose the subject is not able to do this repeated pronation and supination movements. It is called as dysdiadocokinesia. If he is not able to do it properly, it is called dys. Whenever he is not able to do it completely, it is called as a diadocokinesia. And the subject will have some slurred speech because of the incoordination of the ocal muscles. That is called as dysarthria. And the person will have something called as intentional tremor. What is intentional tremor? Whenever he intends to do a movement, suppose he wants to pick up the remote. So whenever he is intending to do a movement, then he will have a tremor, not at rest. Resting tremor, we saw it in the Parkinson's disease. Whereas intentional tremor happens in the cerebellum. Why intentional tremor? Because the function of cerebellum starts to happen whenever a person is in movement only. The cerebellum is always quiet during rest. So when we intend to do a movement, there will be a tremor. And coming to the cerebellar nystagmus, there will be rotation of the eyeballs, like movement of the eyeballs, which happens due to the cerebellar disorders. And hypotonia, 
even in a decerebrate rigidity we saw this hypotonia why hypotonia because whenever any person begins a movement it the first the impulse goes to the deep nuclei of the cerebellum this deep nuclei gives a positive stimulus first so there is slight increase in tone of the muscle so if this positive impulse is not happening what will happen the person can present with hypotonia and finally he will have a drunken type of gait which is also called as cerebellar gait so these are all the activities which will happen in a happen in a cerebellar dysfunction i hope it's clear thank you for watching we'll see in the next video thank you so much